2 Peter 2 and 5 says, And spare not the old world, but save Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. Bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And then Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse number 15. God speaking through the prophet says, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And I will give you pastors. I'm going to let you be seated. Usually I pray, but I just, just going to be a little, it's going to take our time today. I had one of my young ministers text me this morning and said, you know, tear it up. I said, I'm not tearing it up today. It's a different type of message. But we're going we're gonna to hear from heaven. I promise you that. I really believe it. And the Lord gave me this message. Um, at the time, I was actually co-pastoring with my father. I assisted him for nine years, and his health was kind of turning. He asked me to pastor with him. And, and the Lord gave me this message. And when I started writing these things down, everything was like we, speaking to my father and I. We want to do this. We want to be your, you know, that's how it was coming across. And my father passed away before I had a chance to finish putting the message together. And then I realized why God had given it to me. God knew what was about to happen. And God had wanted that special relationship between me and the pew. And, and so one of the first messages I preached after becoming pastor by myself was this message. My title today is more than just a preacher, more than just a preacher. When I preached this the first time, Shane Malloy, brother in the church, was, was back in the sound booth and it was his responsibility to write the title on a CD and those kind of things. And, and apparently he didn't hear me give my title, but he did hear the message. And so, and so he put down what he heard, what, how it came across to him. And the way it came across to him was like this. He's not just my preacher. He's my pastor. That's pretty good, too. I might like his title better than mine. More than just a preacher. And I, God said, I will give you pastors. You won't have to go looking for them. It's not up to you to determine, but I will determine what pastor goes with what flock. And this is what the Lord said through his prophet. And so God is engaged by a covenant with his people to supply a pastoral ministry for the church. And God has said, I'm going to give you an anointed and appointed man of God. I will give you pastors. The church will never evolve to the place where it no longer needs a pastor. No saint will ever reach such high spiritual maturity that they no longer need the men of God to watch over their soul. God said, I'm going to give you a pastor. And if you do not have a pastor, you are out of the will of God. I will give you pastors according to mine heart. God has set some distinguishing marks upon the ministry of which he approves. A man must have a calling from God. The pastor, according to God's heart, has a life that corresponds with his high calling. A true man of God is going to perceive the sins and the dangers of the day. And he's going to give warning from the pulpit to the congregation. And if we will listen to the pulpit, if we will listen to the pastor in our life, it'll save you from falling into some pits and traps that Satan would set for your soul. 
in affliction, the pastor soothes. In temptation, he admonishes. In sickness, he comforts. And in death, he is the one that resigns your heart into the hands of an ever-living God. A man that is after God's heart will not be influenced by the frowns or the smiles of the congregation. He's going to preach what thus saith the word of the Lord. The man of God is going to walk through the midst of the people. He's going to live among the people. He's going to know the people. Therefore, he can speak into the life of the people. The pastor that God gives has authority over the flock. It is God who said that the God-appointed pastor would feed with knowledge and understanding. This pastor I give you is going to feed you with knowledge and understanding, implying that not now, not never, will church leaders, deacons, elders, board members, some important tithe payer, be in a position to inform the pastor of what needs to be done or what needs to be said or what needs to be preached. If it needs to be said, God gave a pastor to say it. If it needs to be, be a direction that's set forth, God gave a man, the pastor, to set the direction in the church. And it's our job to follow the pastor in our life. Amen. I'm speaking of the need for a pastor. Thank God you have a pastor. Thank God you have a pastor. Not everyone that has titled pastor is probably qualified. In fact, they're not, according to the scriptures, qualified to be pastors. There's hundreds, thousands of pastors in the valley. They're not qualified according to the scripture. Thank God your pastor is qualified. Well, hallelujah. Amen. Let's talk about the qualifications of the man that is to be pastor. And we find this in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And beginning in verse number 2. This is the qualifications of the life of this man. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to cheat, teach. I know that word bishop, we use it loosely, many terms. Sometimes somebody gets a position in an organization, and because it's a, you know, they start calling them bishop. That don't, that don't make you a bishop. That's a political office, whatever. And so I know we use it for many, many different reasons, but in this setting and in this context, a bishop simply means the superintendent or the Christian officer in charge of the church. And so in this setting, it's talking about the pastor. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, notice how shall he? Take care of the church of God. It's his job to take care of the church of God. That, that is the qualifications. You can read on some more about the qualifications of the man. And then you go to the previous chapter. Chapter number 2 of First Timothy. And it tells us about the message. I'm going to preach a little bit. Just hang with me. It talks about the message that the man must preach. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Notice supplications and prayers and intercession and giving of thanks. I, I preach this around my church. This is, this is the ingredients you're going to find in an apostolic church. Prayer, praise, and preaching. Prayer, Praise and preaching. Oh, hallelujah. We had some prayer this morning. Then we had some wonderful praise this morning. Uh, and now you're putting up with the preacher this morning. Uh, I'm glad to be in an apostolic church with prayer and praise and preaching. Oh, hallelujah. And then he said for kings and for all that in authority. 
that we may lead a quite peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You're going to be a preacher of righteousness. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. And we know what the message of salvation is. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. A, a true man of God, a pastor, is going to preach the Acts 2, 38 plan of salvation because God said, I want every man to be saved. And you know what? When you come to Souls of Harbor Church, uh, you're going to hear Acts 2, 38. You're going to hear a message that will save your soul. You must repent. And if you've not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, thank God for a pastor that will baptize you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Because God wants everybody to come to the knowledge of the truth. Then he said in verse 5, for there is one God. And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. He's going to be a one God apostolic preacher for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body. The church is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence for it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell. Well, I'm preaching about the mighty God in Christ Jesus. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So the man must be right and the message must be right. He goes down in verse number 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. With shamefacedness and sobriety. Not with broided hair of gold and pearls and costly array. All you have to do, ladies, is look at the first lady, and you'll know how to dress. She is godly, and she is modest. And it runs in the family. Thank God. What examples? What a glorious example that you have. How about we lift our hands and thank God for the pastor's wife? Lift your hands right now. Thank God. Thank God for the pastor's wife. What an example of the believer. I read to you in 2 Peter 2 and 5. About a man by the name of Noah. Here's the deal. The man can be right. And the message can be right, but the people have to also be right. And the people have to follow this man that God gives, this pastor in their life. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I'm not making that up. I read it to you. Right out of 2 Peter 2 and 5. His calling came from God, not from his mommy. I know you don't have problems in Phoenix. Thank God for that. All your churches are perfect. But, but for whatever reason, God raises up preachers out of the church I pastor, Faith Tabernacle. A lot of preachers. But, I, but at times, I, I've had a mom come to me. I, one particular instance comes to my mind right now. Came up to me and like, oh, I want my son to be used. Like, You're not a preacher. <laughs> you, you can't put Mama, you can't put your anointing on him. God has to call him. If I put him into a place of anointing where he doesn't belong, it would destroy him. He has to be called of God. Well, Noah was called of God to be a preacher. And Noah faithfully executed his calling, both by his doctrinal instructions and by his life of righteousness that he lived. As long as he preached, 
the world was warned, and he preached. God honored his preaching with signs following. The animals came into the ark. God shut the door. The rains came. I'm telling you, he preached it, and then God did it. His own family was saved because he was a preacher of righteousness. The message and the man were right. He was a preacher of righteousness. And yet, the people were lost. Because they did not allow the preacher to become their pastor. He was just the preacher. Preaching sermons. Good sermons. Like his sermons. But don't need somebody in my life telling me what to do. Don't call him pastor if you're not in submission to him. Don't call him pastor unless you honor him highly for his work's sake. Oh, I honor this church for honoring the man of God. God's blessings are going to flow in this place. Revival is going to happen. Oh, hallelujah. You know he's your pastor when you get in the boat with him. Let me tell you about a couple of men in the Bible, and they were great men. They really were. The first one was named Saul. And he was heads and shoulders above other men. And it was the man of God that looked him, found him when he was a humble man, hiding among the stuff. The man of God said, you're to be the king, the first king in Israel. What an honor to be the first king. Mighty man of God. You're going to bring victory to Israel, which he did. He was, he was a man. He was a great, great king. And, and then his successor was a man by the name of David. Now, both of them had a preacher. Saul's preacher was the great prophet Samuel. David's preacher for a short period of time was Samuel. And then Nathan was his preacher. Let me tell you about Saul's preacher. He was the great prophet. There are two books in the Bible named after him, first and second, Samuel. Samuel anointed him to be king over Israel. And Samuel prayed for his king. In fact, God, after he had turned his back on Saul, guess what? Pastor Samuel was still praying for this man. He was still praying for this man. Until God finally said, but just stop praying for him. That's how much he cared about Saul. And when Samuel preached, his preaching was straightforward and direct. First Samuel 15, 2, the direct words out of the scripture. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Words that came out of the mouth of uh, Samuel. The preacher, the preacher. And Samuel executed his duties as a pastor faithfully. Yet Saul never allowed this great preacher to pastor him. To lead him. When commandment came from God through Samuel concerning Amalek. Saul obeyed only the portion of the message that he wanted to. I'm sure it doesn't happen in Phoenix, thank God, but it does in Tucson, where some hear the preaching, and what they like, they take. What they don't like, they discard. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, 2 and 3, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek. And utterly destroy all that they have. Anybody think this is ambiguous? Or do you understand what he's saying? I mean, is this? I think it's pretty clear. Utterly destroy all that they have. Spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. You think, oh, well, maybe, maybe Pastor Samuel 
maybe he was just a little excited and a little exuberant and it's not really what God meant. And maybe God wanted something like not quite that hard and not quite that straight. No, no, it's exactly what God wanted. You see, because what Samuel was doing is just preaching what thus saith the Lord to Moses. First, I'll take you back to Deuteronomy 25, 17. This is what God told Moses hundreds of years before. He, he said, remember, remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way. When ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee. And thou was faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore, it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about. This time has finally come. There has been victory. We are established in the land. We have a king. God has given us the promised land. In the land which the Lord of thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. And so when Samuel got up and said, Thus saith the Lord, he wasn't just making stuff up as he went along. He was preaching the word of God. He was preaching truth unto them. Straightforward preaching. Right in line with what Moses had already preached. Thank God you can come to an apostolic church and the preaching is right in line with the word of God. Right out of the word of God. But notice what happened in the pews. The preaching is right. The pastor was right. Samuel is right. Everything about him is right. But everything wasn't right in the pew. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, 7 through 9, And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to shore that is over against Egypt. So far good. So far good. And, oh, now it's, now it's going to go south. And took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But how many saints live their life with the, uh, I know the pastor said that, but I know he doesn't want my kids doing that, but, you know. He spared Agag. And the rest of the land which the Lord let me, spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, the fattens, the lambs. And notice, notice this. All that was good. And would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuge, that they utterly destroyed. In other words, the ugly people do away with them. The crippled lambs will obey God. Because who wants the crippled lambs anyway? Those that are sick and feeble and, and, and they can't help us will do away with them. But if I determine it's good, I'm not going to follow the command of the pastor. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. But the preacher said, destroy all. There was no exception clause to the message. There was no, unless you determine that they are good to keep. There's no exception clause. The preacher said, this is how we do things around here. But he didn't. He spared the best of the sheep, the ox and the fatlings of the lambs. The preacher said, destroy the ox, and the sheep and the camel and the ass. Saul overrode the decision of the pastor. He decided for himself what was evil and vile and not worthy to be in his home and what was worthy of being spared. 
But God never gave him that kind of authority. When he's just your preacher, you can shout and amen when he preaches what you agree with. And the second he starts getting on the thing that you haven't yet committed to the Lord, you can sit and sulk. He ain't your pastor, he's just your preacher. When you just show up to church when you want, you skip when you want, he ain't your preacher, he ain't your pastor, he's just your preacher. You obey him when you agree with him, and you teach your kids to obey him when you agree with him, and that you, you let your children do something other than what is preached from the pulpit when you don't agree with the man of God, then he's not your pastor. He's just your preacher. I can tell you when he's just your preacher, you go out of town, and you don't even let him know you're out of town. You skip church, you don't even let him know you're skipping church. He's not your pastor, he's just your preacher. When you decide to make a major decision on a job, or, or you already have the U-Haul hooked up, and the furniture's already loaded up, before you even talk to the man of God about this move, or about a move to another church. You don't have a preach. You don't have a pastor. You just have a preacher. But God said, I'm going to give you pastors. And there's something about it. When you let the preacher become your pastor, God blesses. You see, when he's just your preacher, there's always some small detail that to you is no big deal. He starts preaching on the holiness, and you don't see it that way. It's just his convictions. And so you go in a different direction. I'm telling you, listen to the pulpit, and, and then put it in your life and watch God bless you. Amen. Don't sift through the rubble seeking out what's good when God said it's, it's corrupt. Don't you call good what God calls evil. Saul, when confronted by his sin, he made excuses for his behavior. Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Oh, he's arguing with the preacher now. He's arguing with the prophet. He's offering. With he, is, he is in an argument with the prophet, his pastor. Well, he's not really his pastor. He's supposed to be. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I've gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I've brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took of the spoil of sheep and the ox and the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice. Oh, for a good reason. To utterly, to make these sacrifices unto the Lord, thy God in Gilgal. Hear me now. I brought Agag alive, and I obeyed the voice of the Lord. That's what we call an oxymoron. Two incompatible statements, such as that was a short wait. We were alone together. Were you alone or were you together? I, I'm going to have the jumbo shrimp. That girl is pretty ugly. Is she pretty or is she ugly? Come on, make me Honest politician. Gay marriage. That's an oxymoron. Because God already said it in the Old Testament. He said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother shall cleave unto his wife. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, and they shall be one flesh. And then Jesus came along and said the same words. Emphasized it. He said, a man and a woman. Made it very clear. Another oxymoron is definitely maybe. Or it was a small crowd. Was it a crowd or small? Make your mind up. And so to say, I, I brought a gang alive and I obeyed the word of the Lord is an oxymoron. 
You obey the pastor in total or you have obeyed none at all. If his convictions are not yours, he may be your preacher, but he's not your pastor. And you need more than just a preacher. You need a pastor. Oh, let the man of God pastor your life. Let me tell you about another man, that his successor, also a king, a lot in common. His name is David. And he also shared the same pastor for a while, Samuel. And then when Samuel passed on, Nathan was his pastor. And we don't know a whole lot about Nathan, especially compared to Samuel. I mean, we know a bunch about Samuel. We don't know a whole lot about Nathan. He certainly is not of the same stature of a Samuel. But he was David's pastor. And the pastor, the pastor came to Samuel. Or came to David. Came to visit his saint. And he said, uh, the Lord, the Bible says, let me just read it. The Lord sent Nathan unto David. He came unto him and said unto him, there were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he brought and nursed up and it grew together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom. And was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man. He spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's listening to this. The pastor is a story. This pastor is a storyteller. Man, he's good. He's good. He's a good preacher. He, he's, he's, he's really good. And... And, and so he, he's telling this story, and he comes to an end. And the Bible said, and David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to, he said to Nate, man, just the thought some rich dude, and David was a rich dude, and just thought some rich dude taking some man's one little lamb and, and killing it. And boy, he would just, man, he was fired up. As the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now, now notice this. And Nathan said to David, David, you know, uh, come to think about it, you're the top tie pair in the kingdom. In fact, David is the top tithe payer in the history of paying tithes because he, collect, he spent his life accumulating gold and silver and wood and precious stones and all of that over $5 billion worth. And then his, Solomon, his son Solomon would build a glorious temple. The materials are worth over $5 billion. That's a tithe. I know you... I, you probably only have two or three like that. It's They're on food stamps, EBT in Tucson. But anyway. To the top tithe payer, he says, thou art the man. And David didn't remind him, by the way, of the top tither. By the way, I've been in this church longer than you. Oh, by the way, my history goes back. My family's here for you, God here. Bless God will be after you leave. No. Uh-uh. This was David's response. He's the king. He's the top tithe pair. He is a man after God's own heart. He's the man that killed Goliath. He's the man that killed the bear. He's the man that killed the lion. He's the man that they're singing songs about him. That he has slain his tens of thousands. He is a great man with a great reputation. How dare you embarrass me like that. He could have taken all kinds of approaches. Instead, this was his response. I have sinned against the Lord. How did he know he had sinned against the Lord? 
Did an angel appear to him? No. Did he have a vision? No. Did he have a dream? No. Did God speak to him in an audible voice? No. Did God put an impression in his heart? No. The only voice he heard was the voice of his pastor. And when he heard the voice of his pastor, he said, I have heard from the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. He associated the voice of the Lord with his pastor. Hear me now. When your pastor gives counsel and advice on a matter, there's no need to pray, fast, talk to your friends, or put out a questionnaire on Facebook. To find the will of God, you just heard the will of God and the voice of God. Now obey it. I know this doesn't happen here because you're a perfect church. But I don't pastor a perfect church. So it's nice to get out and go to a perfect church for a change. That's because I got like people in my church. I know you all, if I, yeah, just like I thought, you got angels' wings hiding under there. I know that. Not in my church. That little horn, never mind. Anyway, I had a young lady. Now, she's like a daughter to us. My wife, almost like, like a daughter. And, and her and her sister and didn't have a dad in the family type of deal with youth leader. And, and a precious, precious, precious young lady. Um, and I remember she came to talk to me about a certain man. She'd been sneaking behind my back and dating him. I found out I did some background check on him and the church he had come from. Man, that pastor said, he, I mean, he kind of told me what for on this guy. And I'd already seen stuff I didn't like. And he hadn't, he'd been there a week. And I told her, don't date him, talk to him. Don't even think about marrying him. Just, you need to get away from him. And here's some reasons. I pointed out some reasons why. Man, this guy is no good. I'm telling you, a Baptist preacher, a Catholic priest would have said the same thing. I mean, you didn't even have to be full of the Holy Ghost to give advice on this. I, I mean, some things we got to pray about and get the mind of God. I think the prayer. Duh. Don't. And, and, and she kind of hung her head and then she left. She came to my office a few days later. And this dumbfounded me at first. She goes, Pastor, remember this precious young lady. Pastor, I prayed about it and I feel good about it. And man, I'm sitting there. I'm thinking, you lying dog. Yeah, ain't no way you prayed about it and feel good about it. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me immediately and said, yes, she did pray about it. And yes, she does feel good about it because I made her feel good about it. And the Lord brought the scripture to my mind. For when they receive not a love for the truth, God, not the devil, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie and that they shall be damned. And God said, I gave her a voice. I gave her you. And she didn't listen to your voice. And so she doesn't get another one. You don't like the voice of your pastor? It's not up to you to go find another pastor. God gave you a man of God. Get in line with the preacher. This nonsense of I don't like what he preached or what he's standing for. How he's running the church. So I'm going to go to another church somewhere. God cannot bless you. You're going to wind up in a state of delusion. Amen. I tell my church, if you don't like my pastoring style, tough it out. Because God knows you need me. God knows what you need. Pray for your pastor. Love your pastor. Listen to the counsel and advice for the man of God. Let's lift our hands and worship the Lord.
Let's worship the Lord. Let, let me mention another king. Let me mention a third king. His name was Herod. And they brought Jesus before Herod. He's already been before Pilate. Pilate can find no fault and sends him off to Herod. And he comes before Herod. Now let me tell you a little something about his history. He had a, he had a preacher, pastor. Well, he had a preacher. His name was, his name was John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a great preacher, a preacher of repentance. And he preached pretty straight. You can't have your brother's wife. Repent. And he was moved by the preaching. But he was one of those kind of guys that the wife ran the family. I, I, I thank God it doesn't happen in Phoenix. It only happens in Tucson. Where the guy says, I, you know, I've, I've said it about some families. I could pastor him. I can't pastor her. Anyway. And his wife didn't like the preaching. She said, I want his head cut off. You want to have a, there's a great message Andy Combs preaches called Preacher on a Platter. Preacher on a Platter. And that's exactly what Herod did with his pastor. Well, he wasn't his pastor, his preacher. He had preacher on a platter. And now he's standing before Jesus. And he said, do some miracles. Give me a word. Say something. The Bible said Jesus said not a word. Why? Because if you're not going to listen to John the Baptist, you're not going to get Jesus. If you cut off the head of your pastor, it's not like you get a direct line. Me and God got our own thing going. We don't need nobody else. That's stupid. What a stupid song. Just a am I'm sorry. What a bad song. My mom was seriously like, I can't believe you said that in his church. How embarrassing. Sorry. What an idiot song. What can I get? Anyway. I did that one time just for fun. I said, I had my son play it. I said, I want you to get the whole praise team up there. Maybe I want him to crank it, man. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. We don't need nobody else. Oh, man, let's go. We don't need nobody else. We don't need nobody else. And they stopped me. I said, ain't that the dumbest song you ever heard? You need your brother. You ain't going to make it without your brother. You're not going to make it without your sister. You and Jesus ain't going nowhere without your brother. And you're sure not going anywhere without your pastor. You are going to need the pastor in your life. You come to the end of the life of Saul. And he's, he's, he's killed all the other preachers now. Once you, once you start killing preachers, where do you stop? He starts killing all of them. And pretty soon he runs out of them. And so what's he doing now? He's chasing witches and wanting witches to connect him with his dead Preacher. Wishing for the old timer that died 50 years ago. I I had a young man in my church, and finally one time I got a young preacher. And I finally told him, I said, you know, you quote verbal being, who's a great man of God. I said, you quote verbal being more than you do your own pastor. I said, he was dead before you were born. He's not your pastor. Well, hallelujah. 
You ought to quote the man of God in your life more than anybody else. I, pa- I pastor a good church. God has really blessed me. I've been running down, but it's really not true. It's, it's a great church. It's a great church. A lot of ministries, a lot of things going on. And I thank God for it. And, and I've been pastoring for 26 years. So I'm not exactly a novice. But when I walked into this building, the most important man in this place is sitting right over here. Today, I'm just a preacher. But this is your pastor. There are great, great men of God that have risen to prominent positions. If today, Brother Carpenter, great church, great pastor, head of ALJC, if he was sitting here, David K. Bernard, sitting here, the head of other organizations, one that's apostolic organizations, filling the front row and filling here, filling here, filling here. There's one voice above all others that this congregation wants to hear. It's the voice of my pastor. Thank you, Brother Bernard, for writing books. Thank you, Brother Carpenter. Thank you, great men of God. This is my pastor. This is the man I follow. I am blessed with good people in my church. I thank God for them. We will have top-notch evangelists. I'm talking about they're preaching NAYC in front of 38,000. They preach conferences and all over. Some of them pastor big churches. And we've been privileged to have them in my pulpit preaching. And you know what my people say? He's, he is really good. But I can't wait to hear my pastor. He's really good, but I can't wait till my pastor gets in the pulpit again. You know what I like? Man, I get with me. Man, I like this today. No wonder my guys like to come here and preach. From the days of Abraham, I'm, I'm, I'm about done, but you know what? This is an important day. It really is. So we're just taking our time. And next year, 10 years, woo, let's make it a big deal. Oh, yeah. Make it a big deal. From the days of Abraham, if you invite me, not to preach, I just come have a, like a Friday night or throw something in there, I and I, I'm in. From the days of a, and I just sit here, just a little, little tiny preacher, sitting somewhere, hopefully close to the big shot. From the days of Abraham down to modern times, sheep have abounded in the Holy Land. In case you didn't know that, the Arabs, the Bible lands, have largely been dependent upon upon sheep for their living for centuries. The Jews of Bible times were the first shepherds. And then farmers, but they never abandoned their shepherd life. And and to know just how many sheep there were in the days of King Solomon, that on one day he sacrificed 120,000 sheep. Now, they didn't obliterate all the herds. That was just a portion. So there may have been, who knows, a million sheep. A lot of sheep. You know what that is? That tells me there were thousands of flocks and thousands of shepherds. Not one shepherd over 120,000. Impossible. Thousands of flocks, thousands of shepherds, just like there are thousands of flocks, thousands of church. One got apostolic tongue talk in Jesus' name churches and thousands of shepherds and pastors. And at times, they came together. 
all of the different herds. Several flocks were allowed to mix. More than one flock sometimes were even kept in the same fold. I've seen that. When we, we were in North Carolina. They started two churches. Wayne Huntley was starting a church, and a, and a young man out of my church, pastor in North Carolina, was also starting a church, and they used the same building. One of the services was Spanish, and one was in English. Two completely different congregations, same building. More than one flock would be kept in the same flow. They were mixed together. There was no attempt to even separate them. In fact, David, or, or Jacob, uh, saw such a mix, mixture of flocks. G Gen Genesis 29, 1 through 3. Then Jacob went on his journey, came into the land of the people of the east, and he looked, and behold, a well in the field, and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by. Is it, before he got there's already three. Different churches, congregations there. When it becomes necessary to separate several flocks of sheep, one shepherd after another will stand up and call out, Tahu, Tahu. And the sheep lift their heads. And after a general scramble, they begin following each one his own shepherd. Yes, yes. They are so tuned to the voice of their shepherd that even if you have 10 shepherds saying, Tahu, Tahu, they know the voice of their shepherd. Not everybody preaching Acts 2.38 is your shepherd. You have a shepherd. Strangers at times trying to peel off sheep from the fold. So, yeah. And they may call out to who and try to mimic the sound of the shepherd and the sheep. Just ignore it like they never heard it. And they wait for the voice of their shepherd. And Jesus said that the sheep would follow him for they know his voice. I know because this is a perfect church. I I don't even have to say this here. But during COVID, I got up and ripped uh, just, just a couple. Because I got to notice it. It's like, you know, there's on Facebook this, or, you know, they're following this and that, something else. I said, if your ears perk up when you hear the voice of a shepherd in St. Louis or Texas or Louisiana or elsewhere, and you follow that voice. They, they have a voice. They have an opinion upon riots. Or they have an opinion upon COVID. Or they have an opinion upon shutting down the church. I said, and if you're listening to their voice. And making decisions for your family. I said, then somewhere there's a shepherd missing a sheep. You need to go follow your shepherd. But if you're in this congregation, you're going to follow this voice. Hello. There are many flocks. But this flock listens to the voice of this shepherd. Don't get distracted by the voice of other shepherds. I had many favorite preachers growing up, and I still do. But the voice of my pastor, my, my dad never preached a general conference, never preached a, you know, like camp meetings and youth camps and those kind of things. But the voice of my pastor was the voice that I turned to at all times. And it rose above all the other preacher voices. Because that was the man of God he put in my life. I will give you pastors, and they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Let's stand and lift our hands and worship the Lord. Oh, let's love God.
Let's love God. Hallelujah. Oh, I praise you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Oh, I praise your name. I praise your name. I praise your name. I praise your name. Hallelujah. 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 Precious God. Precious God. It's good from time to time. Tell your pastor, Pastor, I love you. I'm behind you. 100%. There are two men in my church, both of them retired ministers. One married my mom after my, after my father died, Brother Biggs. The other one is a retired missionary from Mexico, Brother Tony Smith. Every time I preach, every time I teach, I get a text or a call from Brother Biggs. Well, oh, that was the best ever. That was great. That was awesome. That was, that was so wonderful. That was right on line. Every time I preach, every time I teach, and Brother Smith, almost every service, with gout in his legs, poor condition, hobbles up to the front. I, I scramble off the platform so, I, so you don't have to try to climb the stairs, get down on the floor, and, and because his hearing's bad, his voice is... And he gets like, Pastor Connor, that was the best preaching. That was so. Would to God every single saint in this place get with your pastor and his dream and his vision and say, let's take the city. Let's have revival. Let's raise up new converts. Let's have some babies. Let's raise up some ministries and some preachers. Let's raise up some more song leaders and musicians. Let's raise up a whole church. Pastor, we're with you. Lead the way.